Thanks, and great to be here. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a couple of themes. One is measurement. Um, how do we actually make any sense out of this somewhat uh, vexed landscape that we've heard so much passion about, and rightly so? Uh, how do we get measurements right in, a, in the manner that Ruth, uh, when she was speaking on her panel, suggested? And secondly, um, what are we missing in this food picture? Are we, are we seeing everything that the food system is? Or are there some really important things that we are not probably giving the time of day that they deserve? So I call this title, I titled this Food's Ferocious Footprint after a, a session that I did at Yale University some time back, which I, I was told, think of a title that is less boring than the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity for food and agricultural systems. So I said, well, fine, how about this? And they liked it. So I thought, so I, I begin with first reminding us that food systems are not what people think they are. And this is the lovely sort of image of typical large scale agriculture, conventional farming. And the narrative that we were reminded sharply about um, in the previous panel, which is somehow or the other that this is how we were going to solve food insecurity. But that is not the case. Uh, the reality is that three fourths of the food that is consumed in food insecure regions around the world is actually grown there and it's grown by women farmers. Uh, how do we bring this reality into the picture is actually one of the challenges because today's food system, which is driven by this kind of farming mainly, is not in fact succeeding in delivering nutrition. Yes, it may be delivering calories, but calories are not nutrition. Here are the outcomes of this food system. Of the seven billion people of us, 815 million are still starving, going to bed hungry. On the flip side, another 700 million are obese, who are part of a larger population of about 1.9 billion who are overweight. And there is, by the way, some intersect. I'm sorry about this Venn diagram. It's not that terribly clear, but it kind of tells you the story. There is, a cross, there is an intersection between those who are micronutrient deficient and those who are overweight as well. And that's the tragedy. It's not the volume of food that's the issue. It's its distribution and its quality and how we market health. Uh, there's a huge challenge, therefore. When we say the food system is broken, it's actually broken in more ways than one. We're talking about hunger, malnutrition, obesity, diabetes, diet-related and input-related diseases, soil health, greenhouse gas emissions, freshwater scarcity, biodiversity loss. All of these are issues with the food system. And we need to recognize that our evaluation of success in food systems, unfortunately, is using a very narrow lens. It does not cover all of these dimensions. We tend to think in terms of success as per hectare productivity, and typically it is per hectare productivity of single crops. That is completely insufficient. We are missing big things out here. And when I say that you cannot manage what you do not measure, what I'm talking about is both positive and negative externalities. Positive in terms of the fact that small-scale farming is actually providing 1.1 billion employments. And yes, they're not very good employments, and they're not necessarily decent jobs, but we can improve them. And on the negative side, all of the things that I've just mentioned. So we need to bring all of this into our evaluation. Otherwise, if we are either selective or we are blind, we will end up with uh, what my colleagues and I, when we were working on this report called T for Agriculture and Food for Food Systems, uh, we call the problem of the six blind men and the elephant. You'd have the agronomist perspective, which only looks at per hectare productivity. You'd have the economist perspective, which generally focuses on jobs. Then you have the environmentalist perspective, which is about you know, climate and soil and, and water and so on. Uh, but you didn't have an overall perspective because we were not using a wide angle lens to look at what is actually massive system. It's 80% or thereabouts of water usage. It's 40, 43 to 57%, according to one study, of GAG emissions, if you account for everything from the rainforest that's lost to create the field that grows the corn and the soya and, and the cows and to the production and to the waste that we heard about earlier today. So if you take that, it's a big system. It is really significant on pretty much everything. In terms of one particular dimension, the cost to global healthcare, um, the Global Nutrition Report of 2016, which was a study by the United Nations and other respected organizations, said this, and I quote, that diet is now the number one risk factor for the global burden of disease. So it wasn't talking about cigarette smoking or AIDS, it was talking about our diets, what we eat. And I think that is a huge, huge issue that we have to just get to grips with. And some of these diseases we are probably familiar with in terms of diabetes. Uh, some we are perhaps not less familiar with, at least people don't talk that much about endocrine disruption. By the way, we can measure the cost of that. 
these are the costs analyzed for endocrine disruption, by, both by the drivers in terms of pesticides, plastics, and so on, and by the kind of disruption that we are talking about. And the total cost to the European Union, 150 billion euros per year. That's your taxes and in my taxes as well, since I live here now. Um, we have got input-related problems aplenty, herbicides leading to cancer, pesticides causing this disruption, and of course the use of antibiotics leading to uh, antibiotic resistance. You can't really capture all of that unless you think in terms of many capitals. If you think only in terms of financial capital, the profit on the farm, the yield of the crop and its price, then you will always measure a tiny slice of what you should be measuring. You need to think in terms of all capitals. Human capital, that is the people and their employment. Social capital, as in the communities and how they work depending on different kind of food systems. Natural capital, that's the biodiversity and the ecosystems around us. And of course financial capital, because that is important. It's basically the produced component of, of, our, of our system. All of those capitals contribute something to this entire thing in the middle which you see, which is the agricultural and food value chain. I do apologize for trying to rush you through in seven minute slides, which took many, many months, 18 months precisely, to actually work through a 600 page report. Yes, I could go on here for seven hours or even seven days, but I don't wish to, hence, hence the rush. Um, you have to use realistic models. So when we're looking at valuation, valuation is always with reference to something. And you need to create a realistic model of a food system. And this is an actual example. You have to use system dynamic modeling to do this. You can't just look at measure, measuring one yield and one crop. This is the food system as a whole. Uh, you will see this diagram in one of our, our chapters, chapter six, I think. And then you come to a framework, which is a universal and comprehensive. Universal as in can be used in any context and comprehensive as in accounts for all major positive and negative externalities. These are hugely important, and this is exactly what we are missing in our current food systems analyses. What do we use this for? We can use this for any application, which means figuring out whether this food system is better than that, because you've got now many factors that you're accounting for, figuring out whether this food plate is better than that one, figuring out whether this policy is better than the other policy by running the analysis through these, you can do all of these scenario analyses and, and comparisons, or for that matter, a sustainable product versus a less sustainable product, seeing all of the impacts of that on health, on employment, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at it through a, you know, I sometimes call it the eyes of the fly, many facets, a lens which is not just one narrow lens. So when you apply this, then you get some interesting answers. But one of the things that keeps coming up again and again is that the one piece that is missing is the significance of smallholder farms. There's more than 525 million of those. They employ more than a billion point one people. There is, trust me, as an economist, there's not a single alternative occupation that can match that even by an order of magnitude and a half. Whether you look at something like auto industry, 15 million people direct employments, 9 million people in steel, 6 million in information technology, another 5 million in aluminum, whatever. These are tiny compared to the number of people that are employed by smallholder farming, right? So, the answer is not replace it with lots of combined harvesters because that's going to chaos, create chaos because there simply isn't employment anymore in the world. We are already, as a world, short of 200 million jobs. What fun would it be if it were 1.2 billion as against just 200 million? This is not a feasible thought. So the only solutions are for smallholder farming. How can we make it more productive, as in more profit in the hand of the farmer, which means higher yields, but it also means fairer prices and less risk because today the smallholder farmer is taking more risk than the investment banker of the old days because of what's happening on the climate side, on the water and the soil. Let's create some resilience for this smallholder farmer. So these are some of the things that we have to worry about and also recognize the positive side, that if we get it right, the upside is amazing. You can solve for poverty, for hunger, for employment, all of these things at the same time. Why is this a bad thing? So let's apply our minds and especially for the policy makers in the audience, let's focus policy on solving these problems. Good news, solutions do exist. Here's one example with which I'm familiar. I'm from India, and this is a state in India called Andhra Pradesh. It used to be bigger, it's been broken into two states. This is the state after breaking up, which still has 55 million people, of which six million are farmers. And these people have sort of created a sort of movement which is called natural farming. They call it zero budget, but that's not really true. It costs money to even collect the cow's urine and cow's dung and, and all that. So it's not zero budget, but it's cheap farming. And its results are incredible because across all the crops that they have measured across the state, 
By the way, this initiative, when I first encountered it, had uh, about 150,000 adherents. That was three years ago. Today, 750,000 farmers in this state have switched across from chemical-based farming to natural farming. And there are techniques, there are very interesting techniques which go back to the fundamentals of agriculture, which is to think of agriculture as if it were about biology, not chemistry. Right? It's a huge leap of faith, but trust me, when you see it working, you see it working. All eight strains of rice are getting higher yield. Peanuts, which is groundnuts, which is their biggest crop, higher yield on natural farming. And the fruit that they grow, everything from mangoes to papayas to pomegranates, higher yields across this. These are tested experiments, and they are being written about these days. So it does work, and it does scale. And yes, it is opposed by the, well, there's a complaint letter by the chairman of the Pesticides Association of Andhra Pradesh to the chief minister. I've seen a copy. I helped draft a response. So don't worry, I mean, the, the, the incumbents do push back, they're not asleep by any means. Well, the good news is that this is also a story, I think some of you mentioned in the previous panels, about women. And here are two pictures, the one on the left I took. That's a young lady who basically is a scheduled caste, landless laborer who borrowed a lakh of rupees to be able to, 100,000 rupees, to be able to do natural farming and did it so well. So she, she's kind of the bottom of the social pyramid in the Indian context, scheduled caste, landless. And she did so well that she was appointed as a master farmer, which means that she can now go to other place, other villages and teach how she does it. Uh, the lady on the right hand side is proudly taking a selfie, which was tweeted out by the way, by her. Uh, she's a farmer who's showing how well her crops have done on the left-hand side after Cyclone Pithai, which was last year, in December, and compared to the non-ZBMF field on the right-hand side. The scribbling there is hers, by the way, not mine. So, so these are the stories that make a revolution in the way farming is done. My point is, how many of you are involved in helping this to succeed? And I've just named you one person who's clearly involved in preventing it from succeeding. Think about that. There's a lot happening. There's farm subsidies have been talked about, I won't bore you with that, but there's a lot happening and there are some companies which are catching this agenda, the new agenda that is opening up. It's a new world, it's a new world of farming. And companies like Olam deal with four million smallholder farmers. Companies like Sikkim produce only organic food, sustainable food, and do it in a sustainable way, no chemicals. These are big companies, they're getting bigger, and as trends turn and society changes its ways and its interests, they will succeed. Do you want to be among the winners or do you wish to be among the losers? That's a choice. These are economic choices that you make. Our uh, study is there. There's, as a, those who don't want to read 600 pages can read a 40-page summary. This is all on the website. Those who don't have the time for that can read a one-page article that I wrote in Nature. So that summarizes how to do this. But it's worth evaluating these systems and just getting the science right and the economics right. And then if we diagnose our food systems honestly, I do believe that we can heal it. The power is in our hands. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there are several points to pick up on in a sure. rather a short time. Um, but Let's take your sustainable um, small holding, natural farming technique. You've talked about how it's working in a small area yeah. in India. Um, how can we scale it up and extend it to other regions of the world, and also uh, perhaps to larger farms? Mm. It's, it's, uh, in India, it's called uh, natural farming. In, in other parts of the world, like in the US, I think regenerative farming. The principle is the same making use of animal products to re-inject bacteria back in the soil because the whole problem is that uh, we, we treat today's soil uh, as something dead, but it's not, it can be living. And uh, if you get bacteria and funguses and nematodes and worms back in there and doing their job, then they will generate the, the molecules and the suspensions that can be absorbed by the root systems and become food. I mean, plants on average actually exude something like a third of the sugars that they make in their, in their system back into the soil. They're not doing it because plants are stupid. They're doing it because they need to feed those bacteria which they believe are there, which are not actually anymore. Um, but does it depend on, does it work best if you have mixed farming with livestock? Yes, it, definitely. So the supply of, of uh, 
organic material it becomes a lot easier if you happen to be a, if you're a smallholder farmer, right? You basically have a house and maybe one or two cattle. And those one or two cattle are actually really important for you, not just for plowing and for milk and so on, but for producing the residues that can go into natural farming. Right. Okay, so how, how would you then extend it elsewhere, do you think? What's the best way of pushing this model out? Yeah, I think education and, and communication. So, you know, the more platforms we have, I heard a nice example earlier, platforms which connect farmers into communities, enable them to support each other, enable them to share experiences. By the way, the successful formula, both for pesticides and for re-injecting re soil biology, keep changing from location to location. It's not the same practice that's the best everywhere. Each location seems to have its own preferred best model, and people discover it, farmers discover it, and they share it. That the sort of creation of social capital is actually one of the singular most important aspects of this success story. Okay. Um, we've got a moment if anyone would like to ask maybe one or two questions um, of Pavan. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Ed Harris. I'm a, I run a comms agency in Geneva. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. That was very interesting. And I liked very much your comment about uh, swapping a chemistry approach for a biological approach. Some of the companies uh, represented here uh, seem to me to be based on chemistry. I'm wondering what, what would you say to such companies? What would your but advice be? I, I think they need to rethink their business model. I mean, I, um, the... the the smart ones are exiting. I mean, I, Yara purchased the um, urea plant from Tata Chemicals, and um, I think it's Tata Chemicals who did the smart thing. They exited a business which is 60% subsidized, producing stuff which people don't need to buy anymore. I think people just need to be smart about changing their business models. And clearly, there are businesses who are getting it and who are reconfiguring their, their business models to look at the opportunity rather than to keep plying an old model that seems to have had its day. Okay. Any other? Um, yes, please, down, down here. Hello, I'm Charlotte Burton from Ocado. Um, can I understand exactly what you mean by natural farming? So from what I understand, that you're basically saying you're putting the manure from the livestock back onto the ground to help the bacteria... Um, fix the nitrogen and then help all the plants grow from there? No, no, it's not. There are actually four different techniques. This particular mm -hmm. kind, because there are so many different varieties. The one thing in common is that they don't use chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers. So this technique is basically injecting bacteria, which means you literally have to make a soup. That one of the techniques they use is they mix, for example, because they have 200-liter drums, they mix 10, 10 liters of cow urine and cow dung together with some uh, um, jaggery, uh, basically residue from, from, from sugarcane, and, and with some gram flour, which is the cheapest form of flour. And they literally stir it once in a while for three days to let the bacteria form and grow and multiply. The thing becomes a foul-smelling bacterial soup, which they then sprinkle all over the place which they're going to plant on. They use plowing, as everyone does. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, pesticides, they use natural pesticides. There are more than 200 different plant-based remedies that they've discovered through use. Again, that's what I mean about the... the uh, the social capital side of it, communicating with each other, solutions that they found. So these are sort of examples of what happens there. But presumably, if you have chickens or pigs on your small holding, they can be part of the process, can they? Could be. So, I mean, yeah, so the, the farmers in this state have obviously found that, that cow dung and cow urine seems to do the job best, but I wouldn't be surprised to find what you suggested elsewhere. Yeah, okay. Um, any last points? Yes, this may be the last question of the day. Okay, no pressure. Uh, Caroline Drummond, uh, Chief Executive of LEAF, Linking Environment and Farming. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think uh, it must be remembered that there's an awful lot of change that is going on, both from chemical companies whose new portfolio, many of these as biologicals, right through to farmers on the ground. But I think uh, I just wanted to pick up on the manure side and the fact both livestock manure and also human manure uh, which has huge potential in terms of actually acting as a, a natural fertilizer through good processing. Yet there is quite a hard piece of legislation, 
both here in the UK for use of any of uh, any livestock manures on vegetables and, and close market <coughs> products. And certainly people are a bit sniffy about human poo. So uh, I just wanted to know where you felt that transformation might occur with innovation and legislation mm. in this area, because we do need more circular agriculture, <coughs> we do need closed systems, but we need to be a little bit more realistic about mm. some yeah. of the options in terms of well, trying to... Firstly, on human manure, I, I think we eat so many chemicals in our food these days, and plastics as well, <laughs> as a result of the fish. That, so I would be myself a little skeptical about the use of human manure. When it comes to animal manure, remember, this is not about NPK, right? This is not the green revolution thinking at all. This is not about generating nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium into the soil. This is about injecting bacteria into the soil. Now, if you're squeamish about that, then it doesn't work. But I guess 750,000 people are not squeamish, and the fact that they're successful and selling their produce faster than the chemically produced stuff, in other words, it goes off the shelf faster, it doesn't rot, and so on and so forth, people are more interested in that health improves. So I would very much recommend that scientists rethink their traditional uh, sort of worries about using natural products and just see what the correlation analyses are between human health and whether you inject and ingest chemicals or whether you inject and ingest natural products. Thank you very much. That is the final note. Thank you very, very much, Pavan, for a fascinating and very provocative closing um, speech and conversation. Um, there's going to be a drinks reception outside in a moment. I'd like to thank all our speakers, as well as Pavan. You've been wonderful, and the audience questions have been great. Our um, sponsors have been, well, essential, Bayer, Corteva, Louis Dreyfus Company, Syngenta, Deloitte, and of course your own WW, yes. WWF. Um, you, you will get a, um, a follow-up from the FT Live colleagues and about asking you to give feedback. We would really appreciate that because I think this is a great conference. It gets better and will continue to get better with your help. And my final thanks are to my FT Live colleagues for organizing it and particularly Michaela, who was, yes, who was organizer-in-chief. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.